And good evening. We begin Top Story tonight with that deadly tornado outbreak across the south. We told you as we came on the air last night just how dangerous these storms were going to be. And overnight, we saw those tornadoes, the massive devastation, and everything else they brought. Drone video from Caledonia, Mississippi, showing the extent of the damage. Look at this. Roofs torn off homes, other buildings entirely flattened. In Flatwood, Alabama, a 39-year-old woman and her 8-year-old son killed after a tree fell onto their home. 33 tornadoes in all reported across four states. This black funnel cloud in Bassfield, Mississippi, you can see how dark it was, car carving a terrifying path. The same system spitting up a water spout off the coast of Panama City Beach, Florida. And the storm still wreaking havoc up and down the East Coast, dropping inches of rain. Bill Karens is standing by with the full track, but we begin down south with Blaine Alexander, who leads us off tonight. In the brutal aftermath of this tornado outbreak, this is an area where people gather, the community members, you know, cherish this like a home. The community of Flatwood, Alabama, took the hardest hit. This is devastating and life-changing, you know, impact that will affect our area for many years. A powerful system that produced at least 33 reported tornadoes across four states, leaving thousands without power and claiming two lives in this home, a 39-year-old mother and her 8-year-old son. Gregory Davis lives across the street and says neighbors tried to help as first responders arrived. The tree was down. They couldn't get in. I took my phone and started waving it to them, like, over here. And they kind of climbed, and we, I helped them pull the limbs. Nearby, this neighborhood church has become a refuge. Almost every member was impacted. Windows broke in my bedroom, and it was on the floor. It was just terrible. How much notice did you have? Me? I didn't have none, because I'm asleep. Parts of the South are now littered with the telltale signs of potential tornadoes and sightings from Panama Beach to Jackson County, Alabama. In Caledonia, Mississippi, this is what's left of a fire station. Tonight, as the National Weather Service continues to survey the damage, experts say it's giving way to a disturbing trend, tornado season stretching later into the year. 15 years ago, would you see storms like this so late in the season? I think they were more a rarity back then, but we're starting to see a definitely an increase. Once you get that heat retention, it's just a matter of time before a storm system comes through, and this is the end result. All right, Blaine Alexander joins us now from Montgomery. We can see some of that damage there right behind you. Blaine, I want to go back to that question posed in your story about the warnings. These potential tornadoes were reported in the news for a couple of days. What do we know about the actual tornado alerts in those areas? You know, Tom, that's what experts say really is so dangerous. For days, we heard officials essentially say, listen, be prepared. Be prepared for your power to go out, for these deadly storms. Have your batteries and things nearby. But when it comes down to the storm actually arriving, it can happen in seconds. So many of the people I spoke to said that, yes, they were alert, but they were sleeping. They didn't hear the sirens. Their TVs were on. Those things, of course, cost seconds, which are crucial in situations like this. Blaine, as your photographer there is zooming out, I got to ask you, where exactly are you tonight? And and what happened there, what, whatever's left of it. Yeah, this is Flatwood, Alabama. What you see right here, this was a community center. This was kind of the place where when I talk to people, they say this was where they would have birthday gatherings. You can even see some of the Christmas decorations strewn about amongst this rubble. This really was a center of, of this very close and tight knit community. It's something that they say that they will rebuild. But, you know, we know that there's going to be a long road ahead. So many different areas around here kind of look the same way, Tom. It's so wild when you look at that damage, the chairs stacked up right next to you and everything else, chaos. All right, Blaine Alexander leading us off tonight here on Top Story, staying with this tornado outbreak and now the stories of survival. Our Sam Brock visited one town in Mississippi where many residents rode out that storm inside their home, even hiding in bathrooms. But despite the widespread destruction, they all live to tell the tale. In the flattened neighborhoods of Steens, Mississippi, there are certainly demolished homes, devastated souls, and a lifetime of possessions emptied for the world to see. But what you won't find, miraculously, are any families grieving the loss of life. So it's the second time yeah. on this property mm -hmm. that you've been hit by a tornado. Oh, yeah. And you've yeah. lived to tell about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not more than two, but... Uh... It happens. In the case of 66-year-old Richard White, who left before the storm to look after his dad. He's older and he's, he gets real nervous when these come around. Then they had them sirens going off. Yep, it was pretty rough. 
His return home today highlighted the presence of a possible guardian angel. So if that had been one over, it would have been your bedroom. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you see that and think that could have been life or death? Oh, yeah, <laughs> real quick, real quick. And the miracles just kept on coming. You know, I'm looking around you right now. You have the side of your wall caved in. There is no roof. No roof. Where were you during the storm? I was in the bathroom, in, a, in my hallway, on the north side of the house. And you'll see why in a few minutes. Take a look at the inside of James Brown's house. What's right there? That was my store shed. And now you have a clear view of the field behind your house. I have a clear view of the field. See, it came right through here. The living room, patio, and rear bedroom were all ripped away as he hid in the bathroom holding this transistor radio. I had a phone there. I had a radio right here. I had my remote control. Brown's bedroom and bathroom managed to stay untouched while everything else in the home met Mother Nature's might. Did you think you were going to survive in that moment? Well, yes. And that, where I was at, because it wasn't... I, would, I, I felt safe where I was at. What evidence did you have that you were going to live through this? Uh, just that maybe the good Lord told me I need to survive, I guess. A blessing for sure, as this unincorporated community in eastern Mississippi felt awfully connected tonight. Sam Brock joins us live tonight from Steens, Mississippi. Sam, I, I look at that video and, and I listen to your story and I, I just don't understand how people survive that. The tornado literally <laughs> ripped trees in half right next to them. It's a fair question. I don't know that a lot of people understand. If you look behind me, that's the house where James Brown was. So I think it's likely a combination of things, Tom. Part of it is just the geographical disposition of this area. It is not densely populated. Also, people like James did go inside. They knew where they were supposed to be if disaster struck. He went to the bathroom. That was the right thing to do. But most importantly, you have luck involved. These were not long track tornadoes. They didn't last 50 to 100 miles. They were more like two or three miles. And we are very grateful to this community was, in fact, lucky. Yeah, Tom, very lucky. You. Sam Brock for us tonight. Sam, we appreciate it. For more on the forecast and what happened with all the tornadoes overnight, I want to bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns. And, Bill, let's actually start where Sam left off there. I mean, it really is luck. A, a tornado is not like a hurricane, and we were reminded of that last night. Yeah, we know we had strong tornadoes. We had 30 tornadoes, at least, maybe 32. We'll get the official number in a couple of weeks. But we didn't have that tornado that was on the ground for a long period of time that went through a town and just devastated the community. You've seen it. It was isolated houses here and there. And unfortunately, well, the one in the middle of the night, that was this one right here across the border from Mississippi to Alabama. That's where the two lives were lost here. That's where Blaine Alexander was located. Uh, Sam Brock was up here near Columbus Air Force Base. That's the one that we saw you know, the destruction and those survival stories on. But there was many others. All through this region. So as we went through the morning, this morning there was a really nasty thunderstorm. Mobile, Alabama had the tornado sirens going off. That didn't touch down. And then during the day, this all fell apart over North Florida. No reports of any significant damage. It was windy for a while. There wasn't even a lot of power outages with this outbreak. We didn't really see that many issues with getting power back on. The winds are very light right now. The forecast for the rest of the week actually looks very nice for this region. So they'll recover where they need it. Uh, Bill, I, I want to take a live shot now of the Rockefeller Christmas tree because this storm system is not done with the U.S. just yet. I know we're feeling uh, some of the outer rain bands. It has been incredibly sloppy all around New York City. What can we expect tonight into tomorrow over here in the East Coast? It's been a rough travel day. Uh, we saw delays, um, ground stops at JFK, Newark airports, and also significant delays at Reagan International and at LaGuardia. The heavy rain has shifted out now. It's from Hartford to Boston and up into areas of Maine. The rain is over with in New York City for the tree lighting. But the winds have been very strong all day long throughout this region. And we still have wind advisories for almost 40 million people. The highest gusts around JFK and also towards eastern New England. Those winds will die off overnight, and the forecast will improve. Now, We'll start talking tomorrow about the new big storm for the West Coast. Okay, Bill, we thank you for that, and we'll tune into that storm tomorrow. Now to the latest on the investigation into the brutal murders of four students at the University of Idaho. Tonight, a campus-wide vigil under tight security as students who are too afraid to return to school can finish the term remotely. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in Moscow, Idaho, with the latest. 
Outside the home that's now a crime scene, police towing away five snow-covered vehicles that haven't been driven in weeks. Police say the cars are being moved to a secure location. Most of our evidence collection uh, has been completed. Um, as we find other tips or leads that lead us in a different direction, uh, we will collect more evidence. Um, if there's something to collect, we most definitely will collect that. In the early morning hours of November 13th, police say Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez were stabbed to death in their shared home. Police have not made an arrest nor found the murder weapon. On campus, students say the unsolved murders are weighing heavy on their minds. I have an evening class that I go walk to in the dark and come home from in the dark, and I have my roommates take me to that now. And parents like Brian Kittleson, keeping his freshman daughter home after Thanksgiving. You don't want to be that parent that says it was okay and then something happens. The university's dean of students responding to those ongoing fears. It's scary uh, what's happened and it's horrible and I, I can't fault any parent for having those concerns. This evening the victims lives are being remembered with a candlelight vigil on campus. But with the suspect still at large, one family member telling Gotti Schwartz about a grim fear. You're worried that the killer yeah. might show up to their service. Absolutely. Their candlelight vigils, you know, all of that. It makes me sick that this person could be there standing right behind us, waving a little candle. You know, it's sickening, absolutely sickening. We're sick. We're just sick. We just wanted to end. Devastated families frustrated by the lack of information. They're kind of just telling me that they can't tell me much, which is frustrating. Investigators say they've conducted 150 interviews and processed more than 100 pieces of evidence, received more than 1,000 tips, including rumors Kaylee might have had a stalker. This is a criminal investigation, and so we can't throw all of our cards on the table and tell everybody everything that we have. A community in fear coming together to grieve the loss of four young lives. Morgan Chesky joins Top Story tonight from Moscow, Idaho tonight. Morgan, we know there's that vigil planned, and as we heard in your report there, some family members are really concerned about who could potentially show up to this. Yeah, Tom, there is. There is a concern that several of the parents of the victims have expressed to NBC News and that this person who committed this horrific crime may be trying to come and witness one of these vigils in person. One family going so far to say, Tom, that they're holding off on having their child's funeral out of fear that this killer could try to attend that as well. So that is the feeling of unease that has permeated this entire community and that we'll be witnessing firsthand when we show up to that vigil later today. Tom? Okay, Morgan Chesky for us. Morgan, thank you. Now to a stunning rescue in Florida. Police body cam footage showing the moments an officer jumps into a canal to save a woman trapped in her car. Stephen Romo has the video and the story. You're watching a heroic rescue caught on camera. After a Florida woman drove her car into a Cape Coral Canal early Tuesday morning and was trapped inside as the car sank below the water. Give me, give me here, give me this car. Give me the light. Her muffled screams were heard by Officer Kowesi Johnson, who jumped right in and immediately started smashing the car's windows with his baton. Try the back window. Try the back. Pulling her out just in time. Try to get out. Grab her, grab her. The body cam footage shows the car's interior entirely flooded as she's lifted to safety. Is there anybody else in the car? No, there's nobody else in the car but me. It's still not clear what led up to the accident, and security camera footage from a neighbor's home obtained by our affiliate WBBH raises even more questions. It's almost like she uh, she thought that, that the street just kept right on going. That video shows the car turning into a cul-de-sac and driving off the asphalt, stopping for a moment before she keeps going, driving through Linda Howick's front yard and then into that canal. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Neighbors living along the canal witnessed right that commotion. She was already out and they were putting her in the ambulance. Mel Strasberg says she was standing with the unidentified woman's boyfriend who told her she called him before calling 911 from inside the canal. 
that's a matter of seconds that could have made a difference. Tonight, it's Officer Johnson's quick thinking that's being hailed as heroic. That was absolutely incredible. He certainly is a hero. Stephen Romo now joins us live in studio. So, Stephen, do we have any updates on how that driver's doing tonight? We do know that she was sent to a hospital in the area. Her condition, though, right now is not clear. We also reached out to the police department to find out what led up to this. Still no answers from that. But something we can focus on is just how incredible that officer's actions were, just jumping into action, able to save her, all in just a few moments of getting on the scene there. Tom. And to be clear, it's still a mystery of how she ended up in the water, why she seemed to have driven or lost control into the canal. Yeah, a lot of questions remain about exactly how she ended up there, something we're still asking police if they can give us any answers for. Okay, Stephen Romo for us. Stephen, thank you for that. When we come back, warning signs? A survivor of last week's mass shooting at a Walmart now alleging the company knew about the suspect's violent behavior and threats. The massive lawsuit just filed. Plus, the latest on the investigation into the murders of two young girls in Delphi, Indiana. The piece of evidence that helped crack the case after more than five years. And killer robots? The debate in San Francisco, why some are calling to have police robots armed with explosives. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Wednesday night. Back now with killer robots. Supervisors in San Francisco voting to allow police the ability to use potentially lethal robots in emergency situations. It's led to a heated debate with emotions running very high. Valerie Castro has the details for us. This police robot, as menacing as it looks now, isn't a deadly weapon, at least not yet. It's currently equipped to defuse bombs, but a Tuesday night vote by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors... The amended item number 28 passes by a vote of 8 to 3. ...allows San Francisco PD to outfit current department robots similar to this with explosive charges. A spokesperson for the SFPD says they'll only be used to contact, incapacitate, or disorient violent, armed, or dangerous suspects when lives are at stake. We're we're talking about using a robot that we've had for 11 years in the San Francisco Police Department. This is not brand new. We use the robots every single day. Critics worry the move will create a police state. The city's public defender tweeting, we are a city, not a military. Before the vote, some supervisors voicing their concerns that this could be crossing that line. This is a local police force here to protect us. This is not the U.S. military that we are arming. And there is serious potential for misuse and abuse of this military-grade technology. This should not become the preferred way that we take down people that are committing crimes. While some in favor of the vote argued the narrative is backwards and the tool could actually be used to save lives. If I didn't know any better, you would think SFPD just woke up one day and thought it would be really cool to go out and get some killer robots and go terrorize the community. And that's not at all what's happening here. It's fear mongering against the police. A police robot with explosives might sound far fetched, but the method has been deployed before. In 2016, during a mass shooting in Dallas, police there scrambled to equip a remote controlled robot with a bomb to kill a sniper who shot 12 police officers and killed five during a protest. Okay, Valerie Castro joins us live on set now. So, Valerie, do we know if there's any sort of protocols in place to make sure the robots aren't used, but only in extreme situations? Right, so there was a stipulation in the policy that was passed that only a few high-ranking officers will be allowed to authorize the use of these robots. And then, of course, only officers with specialized training will be allowed to deploy them. So we heard about some of the debates there. Did anyone bring up the point that this could potentially save the lives of police officers as well because it takes them out of the line of fire? Well, actually, there is concern that this removes the human element of having someone there engaged with a suspect when they make the decision to use deadly force. One council member says it's not the same as uh, pulling a trigger on a firearm, pushing a button on a remote control is something different. And she worries that once the tool is there, it begs to be used. Yeah, and they brought the point about this is a local police force, not a military, though drones are used as robots sort of armed as well. Okay, Valerie, well, thank you for that. When we come back, a potential breakthrough in the fight against Alzheimer's. The experimental drug, experts say, seems to be slowing progression of the disease that affects millions of Americans every year. Stay with us.
All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the $50 million lawsuit stemming from last week's mass shooting at a Virginia Walmart. A survivor of that shooting, who is a Walmart employee, alleges the company ignored reports about violence, threats, and strange behavior from the gunman, who was a store supervisor. That man fatally shot six employees in a break from break room last Tuesday before dying from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And new details tonight in the murders of two young teens from Delphi, Indiana. Newly unsealed documents reveal a 40 caliber bullet found near the bodies led investigators to 50-year-old Richard Allen. It's the first time we're hearing why Allen was arrested. Last month, more than five years after the murders, authorities say he was interviewed shortly after the killings but was not arrested at the time. And police in New York City are cracking down on counterfeit goods amid a busy holiday season. Video shows officers loading thousands of luxury knockoffs, including fake Prada, Gucci, and Louis Vuitton bags onto a flatbed truck. Police say they seized nearly, get this, $10 million worth of products from Canal Street vendors and arrested at least 17 people. And a potential breakthrough in the fight against Alzheimer's. Results from a clinical trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine found experimental drug lucanumab slowed the rate of cognitive decline by 27%. The study focused on patients in the early stages of the disease. However, about 20% of participants experienced brain swelling or bleeding. Okay, we turn now to an NBC News exclusive. It's been exactly one month since three American tourists died at an Airbnb in Mexico City. Their families say it was due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Now they're calling on Airbnb to change its policies. Tonight, they're speaking together publicly for the first time with Gabe Gutierrez. These three Americans went on vacation last month and never came home alive. As a mom, how do you, how do you deal with that type of loss? Moment by moment, I'm still in disbelief. Jennifer Marshall says her son Jordan died of carbon monoxide poisoning. His friends Candace Florence and Cortez Hall were also found dead inside an Airbnb-listed apartment in Mexico City. Ciola Hall says she got the dreaded call on her birthday. And I say, no, no, not my son. Speaking together publicly for the first time exclusively to NBC News, all three families are announcing a planned lawsuit against Airbnb, calling for all of its worldwide listings to mandate carbon monoxide detectors. Well, it's a massive problem because they regulate what they want to regulate. The planned lawsuit comes after another group of American tourists died from carbon monoxide poisoning earlier this year at a resort in the Bahamas. The CDC says more than 430 people are accidentally killed by the gas each year in the U.S. I cannot process in my mind why my daughter is not here today. Airbnb tells NBC News this is a terrible tragedy and our thoughts are with the families and loved ones as they grieve such an unimaginable loss. And while the company has not confirmed the reports of carbon monoxide exposure, it does give away combined smoke and carbon monoxide detectors to eligible hosts. Is that enough? It's not enough. We could still be talking to and, you know, spending the holidays with our kids. Airbnb also says it suspended that listing in Mexico City and canceled any upcoming reservations. Tom? Okay, Gabe, we thank you for that. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and a letter bomb going off inside the Ukrainian embassy in Madrid. Ukrainian officials say an envelope exploded in the hands of the embassy's manager. He was rushed to the hospital and is expected to be okay. No one else was hurt by the blast. The Ukrainian ambassador to Spain said the letter was addressed to him, but it's still unclear who sent it. An update on those protests in China we've been following. The communist government there promising a strong crackdown on demonstrators. New video shows residents in Shanghai clashing with COVID workers. Authorities in several cities deploying armored vehicles and police in riot gear. Protests have been boiling over for days over the country's strict zero COVID policies. And Colombia asking the Biden administration to grant temporary legal status to its citizens in the U.S. Colombia's ambassador is saying the move would help ease migration challenges in the region. He says Colombia is currently hosting about 2 million Venezuelans who fled their own country. The White House has yet to respond to Colombia's request. And Fleetwood Mac singer, songwriter Christine McVie has died. Her family announcing her passing today after a short illness. She joined the British rock group in 1971 after marrying bassist John McVie, going on to write some of their biggest hits, including Little Lies and You Make Love and Fun. In a statement, the group calling her, quote, one of a kind, special and talented beyond measure. Christine McVie was 79 years old. Now to the Americas tonight, focusing on Haiti and the humanitarian crisis plaguing the country. A New York Times article titled, 
As Haiti unravels, U.S. officials push to send it an armed foreign force, gives an inside look into what is happening on the ground there, and now for the push for an international intervention. It comes amid escalating violence in the country, including this attempted assassination of Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry in January. For more on this, I want to bring in the author of that article, New York Times Bureau Chief for Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean, Natalie Kitroff, and Senior Fellow Military Expert for Defense Priorities, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. Thank you both for joining Top Story tonight. Natalie, I want to start with you. This was your story and your reporting. You travel with the Haitian National Police, this gang-controlled area of Port-au-Prince. This is an area you report on quite frequently. So I have to ask you, who's in control of Haiti right now? Is it the gangs or is it the government? Well, much of Haiti's capital, most of it, is in the hands of gangs. Gangs have been around in Haiti for decades, but they've become more brazen and they've gotten more and more powerful. And they have started to take over growing expanses of the capital. And when we traveled with the police, we saw this. We were in a, an armored vehicle and the Haitian National Police did not want to leave the vehicle because of the danger outside. That gives you a sense of just how dangerous Haiti is. If armed police officers cannot even step outside, you can imagine what's happening. And, and Natalie, on that point, we just saw the image. I'm going to ask my director, Brett, to put it up once again. It shows the military type tactics these police have to use. But if you look closely at this photo, you can clearly see the officer there. He has all of his tactical gear on, but the window is completely shattered. I don't know if you noticed this while you were reporting, but what it tells me is that there's an arms race essentially between these gangs, right, and the government. That's right. The gangs are very well armed. Um, the police told us that they have their own assault rifles. They have a lot of ammunition. Um, they are armed like militia. And the police in Haiti are struggling to confront them. They're underpaid. They often have worse weapons. And this is, you know, a kind of battle that the police are trying to wage every day. But and, in and, many cases, not winning. Right. Lieutenant Colonel Davis, I, I want to read you a section of Natalie's reporting here that I think is so important because it really sums up what's happening here. Now fearing that the humanitarian crisis engulfing Haiti could spur mass migration to the U.S. and elsewhere, some top Biden administration officials are pushing to send a multinational armed force to the country. Several current and former officials say after the Haitian government made an appeal for such an intervention last month. But the U.S., doesn't want its own troops included in that force, even though officials fear that the tumult in Haiti will send an even bigger wave of migrants to American shores. So, Lieutenant Colonel, I have to ask you, is this feasible? Is this a feasible ask from the United States, essentially saying we need military intervention in Haiti, but we don't want to go? Well, you know, I, I think it's for good reason. And, and certainly there are some issues that, uh, you know, have the effect of the United States, but it's primarily a humanitarian issue for the United States. But look, we have to look at this in context. The U.S. right now has 100,000 troops in Europe, most of which are around the border with the war between Russia and Ukraine. We've also got tens of thousands in the Middle East, uh, thousands more in, in, uh, in South Korea, in Japan, et cetera. We just can't add another mission like this that could go on for unknown period of time. Um, so I think it's appropriate that we say we, we can help coordinate and set up, but we just can't do everything. And I think this is one of them that uh, we just can't add right now. Yeah, but Lieutenant Colonel, I, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Haiti's on our side of the globe, right? Haitian Americans are, are a part of American society. Uh, there could be an immigration crisis if things continue to get worse in Haiti. People are already fleeing at record numbers. Isn't it time for the U.S. to act? Well, you know, but I think that we rely, relax, or go too quickly to the military card. Uh, and, if, and if, you know, they need it for their security inside there, then I think maybe an international uh, organization is the one. Because, look, we also have to admit the U.S. military has a pretty bad track record in Haiti, and there's a lot of bad blood still to this day in there. So I think that for many reasons, it's appropriate for other members. The United States can't be the only one in the Americas that can bring in military forces. The lieutenant colonel obviously referencing some interventions during the Clinton years there. Natalie, but he brings up a lot of good points, and it is interesting because you bring this up in your story as well in the New York Times, the need for armed forces from other nations. It's actually met with mixed emotions, even from the people of Haiti who do want change, because due to the large-scale recent illnesses caused by U.N. volunteers back in 2010. 
That's right. I mean, you know, Haiti is a country with a long history of brutal intervention from abroad, and bitter memories remain about all of these past attempts to stabilize Haiti that never yielded that long-term stability that they wanted, right? So the U.S. government is aware of this, Haitians are aware of this, and so are other countries. Nobody thinks this is going to be an easy mission. And the challenge is that Haitians on the ground right now are experiencing a suffering that they told me they hadn't seen in their lifetimes. There is a humanitarian crisis underway in the country, and no one right now knows exactly what to do. Lieutenant Colonel, do you think any other countries would want to act? It, it, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, so you, you have to ask the question, why would, would other nations, if the U.S. is not willing to step up, why would other nations try to form some type of military force to, to go in and try to stabilize that country? I mean, I, I think that's a fair question. Uh, but right now, I mean, if you're just looking at the hardcore truth, I don't think there's a lot of people that would like to sign up for that are certainly not going to be eager to do so because this is a tough military mission, whoever got it. I mean, the, you know, the question is, what's the militarily achievable mission? How much risk are their troops going to be and whoever has to go in there? What are the rules of engagement? You know, what's the long term? How much is it going to cost? Those questions, as hard as they are, have to be answered before we start putting anybody's troops on the ground. It, 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 those are all fair points. Natalie, I, finally, I want to end with you. I want to go back to your reporting. You encountered a lot of regular people who are becoming victims of the gun violence, of the gang, gang violence there, including children. And we have one photo showing two little ones. And this really stood out to me, recovering from gunshot wounds. Talk to us about, about these kids here and, and, and some of the other regular people you came across who, who are just caught in the crossfire every single day. So there are thousands of Haitians that have fled violence that are living on the streets right now. And I've talked to many families and many children who were victims of gun violence that are still recovering from their wounds. These two kids captured by our photographer, Adriana Zabrowskas, are examples of that. These are kids who are, as you can see, they still have bandages. One of them has a, a bag attached to his body. Um, you know, you talk to folks who saw their own family members killed in front of them. And so these are folks that are struggling for survival. And often the children are really bearing the brunt of this. Natalie Kitroa from the New York Times, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, we thank you for joining Top Story tonight. When we come back, the changing world of American media CEOs at Disney and AMC admitting they're having a hard time turning a massive migration to streaming into profits. We'll take a look at these media giants and how they're looking to turn their companies around. That's next. Welcome back to Top Story. These headlines are not good. Across the media landscape, companies announcing layoffs with the industry at a turning point. The CEO of AMC Networks putting it bluntly in a memo to staff this week, announcing large-scale layoffs, saying in part, quote, it was our belief that cord-cutting losses would be offset by gains in streaming. This was not the case. We are primarily a content company, and the mechanisms for the monetization of content are in disarray. The returning CEO of Disney, Bob Iger, speaking to his employees, echoing this, saying, instead of chasing subscribers with aggressive marketing and aggressive spend on content, we have to start chasing profitability. So what does this all mean for the future of entertainment and the way you enjoy televisions and movies and sports? I want to bring in Reed Alexander. He's a correspondent at Insider covering Hollywood media and finance. Reed, the model is definitely changing from broadcast and cable to streaming, but the ad dollars and revenue isn't catching up. Why? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question because, as you rightly point out, so many people want on-demand, direct-to-consumer content. They want to watch their shows when they want to watch them. And many times we're seeing in quarterly earnings results and from month to month the number of subscribers increasing. It's streamers like Netflix, which did have some rocky times earlier this year. Disney keeps growing its subscriber bases. So why is revenue down and why are we seeing these layoffs? Well, one thing that has pivoted in recent years in the media landscape is these streamers are no longer just valuing the worth of their streaming services and the companies that own them, say Apple, you know, Netflix, Amazon, these big tech giants, based on subscriber growth. It really is a lot about advertising and cost of producing content. 
And cost of producing content has gotten so expensive, and they are investing so much money. I mean, Disney saying it's actually lost on its streamer $1.5 billion in the last quarter because of the cost of investing in streaming content. That we're seeing these huge costs, and we're in, of course, everybody knows, a very difficult economic environment. It is no laughing matter, and that is putting pressure on corporate brands' ability to advertise and market with many of these platforms. So, and when there is pressure on budgets, yeah. Yeah, so, so our viewers follow you. Basically, what's happening is that people now in America and around the world are consuming more content than ever before. So all the big studios, all the big media companies are pumping billions of dollars into producing content, but they're not really getting the ad dollars back. And so I guess my question is, Reed, they've been at this for a while and the tech companies have figured out how to make money uh, online and on phones. Why haven't media companies figured that out yet? Because media companies don't really have that ethos, right? I mean, a lot of these companies have been around for decades and decades, if not generations, in Hollywood. And their whole mentality for the course of much of their lifespan has been selling content to consumers via the airwaves, via linear television, or in many cases in the movie theaters. They're very much playing catch-up, where these tech companies, they have been incubated in a digital age. Their whole mindset, you know, the tech companies of this generation, has been figuring out how to market and sell to consumers via the internet. Internet. So selling content to them via a streamer is nothing outside of their wheelhouse. And in my view, the trend lines do benefit these big tech companies and these streaming companies, and I include Disney in that, even though it's not necessarily a tech company, for the long term. The question is, how do they get through the short-term headwinds that we're seeing, as you rightly point out, with ad dollars down, whilst they still have to pump out so much content in order to satisfy their consumer demand? Now, one thing they have done, which appears to be somewhat successful in the this regard is introducing cheaper subscription models, right? Ad supported tiers where they can kind of hybridize their revenue based on the subscription that each person is paying, say six, seven, eight, nine dollars a month, depending on what it is, with you know ad revenue. So they're able to kind of balance the two that way. Do you see bundles as the wave of the future? I mean, there, there are so many different streaming subscriptions you can sign up for right now that I was having a conversation with our top story staff about how much people pay. And, and for some people on our staff, it, it almost feels like they're paying more or the same as they were paying for cable. Yeah, I think people are spending a lot of money on these because if you are, say, subscribing to, you know, sports platforms, you might be spending uh, for a subscription $70 a month. And then you have Disney and Netflix and Amazon. And by the time you've wrapped them all up, you could easily be spending more than $100 a month in some cases. Now, I think the average is lower than that. But you're right. A couple of years ago, the narrative was people sort of shedding their cable packages in favor of these much cheaper streaming services. I think there won't be a way to avoid bundling, you know, for these streams companies, if they are going to try to continue to grow their subscriber bases in a time where there is inflation and people are not locked up at home during the pandemic, just spending whatever they can spend on streaming because they're not spending it in the restaurants or the bars or the nightclubs and they want to stay entertained at home, there is going to have to be some kind of give and take here. Now, one way we could see bundling happen is, you know, Disney owns about two-thirds of the equity at Hulu, which is, you know, one of the popular streamers here in the U.S., and Comcast owns the other third. Um, you know, Disney has a new CEO, as you well know. Bob Iger is back. And one thing that Wall Street is hoping he will do is figure out how to reconcile with that kind of split ownership. And then maybe Hulu content becomes part of Disney, and you just pay for one subscription service a month. So I do think that's going to have to happen, but that raises questions about consolidation and acquisitions. And, you know, we're in an environment where there aren't a lot of deals happening right now. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Reed Alexander from Insider, we loved your analysis tonight. Thanks so much for that smart conversation. When we come back, something else you can stream tonight, the Rockefeller Christmas tree lighting. And the man who picks out the world's most famous Christmas tree joins Top Story, how he finds the perfect one year after year. That's next. And we are back. Tonight is the night. You're looking at it right there, the world's most famous tree an 82-foot Norway spruce that comes to us from Queensbury, New York, near Saratoga. And in just a few, more than 50,000 lights will be lit tonight during the tree lighting ceremony here at Rockefeller Center. We are so fortunate to be joined by Eric Pose. He's the head gardener here at Rockefeller Center and the man who, for the last three decades, has chosen which tree will become the world's most famous Christmas tree. Eric, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. When you look at that beautiful tree, I mean, what, does, does it give you chills? Yeah, it gets me excited. It looks great. Do you feel a connection to that, that, that giant hunk of greenery right there? Sure, sure, every year. 
So talk to me, what, what goes into selecting the tree? How hard of a process is it? Well, it's all year. Uh, basically, you're going around all year looking for the perfect tree to get here. And once you find one, then there's a lot of setup that has to be done. You got to water it, you got to feed it, make sure it looks good. And then the logistics of getting it down here. And when you, you go to a forest or some woods and you spot this, this beautiful tree, do you know immediately or does it take some time? Are you kind of tasting maybe the branches, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe sampling the sap, if you will? No, no, no. It's not in a forest or anything. It's on a piece of property. It's all by itself, you know, perfect all the way around. And that's what this tree is. And you can just tell right from first look or do you, does it take you some time to, to know this is going to be the one? Well, usually it, it is the first time, the first look. Uh, when I went past this tree on my way to see another tree, I uh, decided to come back around it. Uh, it was on a vacant... So this wasn't the tree you were even looking for? No, I had gone to, made an appointment to go see another tree and passed this one on the way there. And I decided to come back and made an appointment to go see the tree. And when you see this, I mean, did, like, do you have a reaction? Like, are you like, oh, 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 my, do you, you hit the brakes and you, you get out? <laughs> uh, probably inside, yeah. Yeah. But not out on the road, no. <laughs> and, and then so once it's cut down, I mean, you have to start negotiating with the property owner, trying to find who actually owns the tree, right? Right. Well, this was uh, there was no house on this property, so we had to look up Neil Leibowitz, find out his name and number. And uh, once we got it, he was very excited and he was into it. You know, it, it, it's incredible that people donate these trees, right? Because you don't pay for any of them. Right. It's a donation. And and you were telling me, how long does it take for these trees to grow? Like, how old is this tree? This tree is probably 85, 90 years old. So you have a 90-year-old tree and you have to convince the owners of the property who have seen this tree, maybe for generations, grown their property to donate it to New York City, and I guess to the world, right, for the tree lighting ceremony. Is there a lot of, I don't know, give and take, or do people usually say, yes, you guys can have it, what an honor? Uh, a little bit of both. It is, uh, it is a great honor for them, and, and most of the time people are very excited. Uh, last year there was a little discussion with the family, but it works out and we get the trees. Do you get a lot of submissions? Do people email you? Do they find you? Do they call you and say, I have the perfect tree. It's grown in my backyard. Do you meet random news anchors who say, hey, I got a great tree in a cul-de-sac in my neighborhood. <laughs> How much do you want for it? Yeah, yeah. I met that guy a little earlier before. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we do get uh, submissions online and, and that's what happened with the first tree that I was going to see. It was submitted online and uh, people send it in. They tell a little story about their tree, and if it's good, I'll go check it out. Anything interesting about this tree and interesting stories from when you guys, after you found it to when you brought it over here to, to New York City? Uh, it's just like all the other trees. You know, it's a great process. You get to meet a lot of good people in the town, and uh, the whole town gets excited, and they helped us kind of escort the tree out to the north way and bring it down. Are there any things on the tree that immediately sort of reject it from your list, things that, I don't know if animals are living in there or, or the age or anything like that? Well, we want a nice straight tree, a tree that's going to look good in front it of It has to be there. straight. Yeah, okay. we got to make it straight because you can't do anything about that. Right. But, and then nice and full, you want to be able to look good. And then when you bring it over here, is, is your job done or are you working up until tonight? Or throughout the season? We're actually working up until tonight and then the rest of the season to make sure it still looks good. As a matter of fact, the other day we still uh, drank 20 gallons of water. The, the, the tree? Yeah. So okay. We, yeah, the drink. The Instantly? Well, over the course of a couple of days. 20 gallons? Yeah, the first couple of days. That, okay. Well, the first couple of days it was 90 gallons of water. Wow. And then as, you know, gravity takes over and everything settles. It, and, well, yeah. I mean, this is not like the Christmas tree in the house when you, you got like, you know, a pail or something. How, yeah. how are you bringing that water in? It, pretty much the same. We got a little tank. We roll up there. Okay. And, yeah. and then, you know, we talked about the 50,000 lights. How do you know it can maintain sort of all the decorations? Well, that's why we choose a Norway spruce because it's a nice, big, strong tree. Okay. And then, you know, you've done this for three decades. Is it still special to you? Every year. Every year it's great. It's fun. Uh, I, I keep in touch with some of the family, so it's a lot of fun. And then when you look at the tree right now, like we're, we're getting close to showtime. Yeah. What's going through your head? What are you worried about? I'm not worried. It's going to light. Okay. Anything else, though? Are you worried ever, like, a branch will suddenly fall off, it'll tip over, it'll, I don't know, suddenly go bloop? You know, sometimes that those Christmas trees, you buy those cheap Christmas trees, and they, they lose all their, so their, their, their lifeblood, if you will. Yeah, no, this tree's going to look great all the way until we take it down. Okay. You know so much about Norway spruces and Christmas trees. Let me ask you for some tips for the regular folks at home. What, what are some good tips to make sure your Christmas tree is healthy and looking great throughout the season? Sure. When you pick the tree for your house, you know, you take it home, and you just make a nice fresh cut on the bottom you open it up let it settle and then you put in some water and then what are some things people shouldn't do you know people love the artificial snow they like to get crazy with the ornaments any any do's and 
don't say that, that you recommend? No, they could do whatever we want with their tree. It's great. I just wouldn't put it next to any heat because it will dry out a little quicker. Okay. Eric Pose, we thank you so much. You know, you do such a great job here at Rockefeller Center. But also, you know, thank you on behalf of the country because so many people, this is a special moment for them. This is when Christmas starts. So thank you for all that hard work. Thank you. And if you ever want to start a, a wine company, Eric Rose would be a great name. You this got it. Pose. <laughs> all right, Eric, thanks so much. Now that top story is over, you can see coverage of the Rockefeller tree lighting right here at 8 o'clock Eastern on NBC and streaming on Peacock, of course. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.